One of the most interesting aspects to collaborative law to me is uh, the utilization of interest-based negotiations. This is a way of negotiating that I think may have been developed at Harvard. I'm not sure, but I do know that the Harvard Negotiation Project teaches interest-based negotiation to world leaders. And in fact, I think they use that particular model at the Camp David Accords, and that's uh, how they were able to reach agreement. Uh, what we do in collaborative law is follow the stages of interest-based negotiations, teach them to our clients, so that hopefully after the divorce, if issues come up, they will have learned a process that they can utilize to settle their disputes without having to call lawyers again, without having to go to court. Uh, so it's, to me, we're giving them a tool along with helping them settle their disputes. So what is an interest-based negotiation? The standard way of negotiating in the litigation process is what's called positional bargaining. One attorney says, we want X, and the other may also say, we want X. But what happens is each of them state their position and then try through intimidation or bullying or manipulation or or persuasion to get the other side to move. And so it's people at polar opposites often, you know, with attorneys trying to find ways to get them together, but not to worry, because if they can't, we can always go to court and let a third party decide for these people what's going to happen in their lives and their children's lives. Well, we don't start with positions. We start with interests. First of all, we sit the parties down and we explain to them what they're getting into. This is very different from litigation. And they're about to sign a contract. And that contract is that these attorneys will not go to court with them and that they will uh, openly disclose information that is requested and provide information that maybe isn't requested but they would need if they were on the other side. And it's basically playing cards with all the cards face up on the table. Uh, so the way we start is we ask them to identify what their goals and interests are. What is it they would like to see after this divorce is over, how their lives will be. And the, the standard things that we determine are things that I guess, you know, just about everybody needs. They want financial security, they want a feeling uh, that they have come out of this with integrity, uh, that there's an opportunity for both of them to have a good and continuing relationship with their children. Many people are concerned about an ability to retire, to get health insurance. I mean, there are a lot of issues that come up, but we're identifying issues. We're not identifying positions. And what I tell my clients is the most important things you can do at this stage is to be totally honest about what your goals and interests are and listen carefully to what your spouse's goals and interests are. Because once we get to negotiating, whatever options we develop have to address both your interests. So you have to hear what the other person is saying. So once we establish what their goals and interests are, then we get into what we call information gathering which in the litigation process is called discovery uh, and is probably the most expensive and aggravating um, portion of the litigation process. And that's just getting all the information you need in order to know what you got and start negotiating. Well, in collaborative law, basically we say, what do we both need? What, what information do we need? What documents do we need to look at? Uh, what questions do we need to have answered? And then the question isn't, you know, why would you want to see that or why do you feel that's necessary to know? The question is, how quickly can we get the information? Uh, who, which of you can get it fastest? Do we really need this information? What will it cost to get this information? Do we need to have an appraisal on a house or on a business? We investigate that and then we mutually make decisions about what we will do to get all the information. And once we have it all gathered together, then we go to the brainstorming 
stage, which is take a look at every possible option that will answer the questions, that will resolve the disputes without any discrimination about whether it's a good idea or it's a bad idea. Let's just throw it out there and think about it. The reason this is very, very exciting for me as a lawyer is clients will come up with things that a lawyer would never have thought of, but it just fits, you know, them. Uh, we're not limited by what the law says you, you know, you must do uh, because this person isn't entitled to this property because it has a certain characterization and in our state, you know, you don't deal with it. Well, we don't, we don't deal that way. What we do is we look at what do the facts dictate. A perfect example of coming at things from a different angle is child support. Every state in the United States, uh, I believe, has child support guidelines. And it basically tells people, if this is what you earn, this is what you pay. You know, that's the bottom line. There's a formula, there's a percentage, whatever. We rarely talk about child support guidelines in collaborative law. What we do is we often will ask the financial professional to take a look at where they've been spending their money during the marriage, what they've been spending on the children, what it will take to meet the children's needs, and that includes often lifestyle issues, will often include the, the lifestyle issues of the primary custodial parent, and then we take a look at the assets that are available to, uh, to meet those needs and say, okay, how are we going to allocate the assets and the available cash flow to meet the children's needs, to meet the needs of each of you after divorce? It has amazed me how much more child support uh, people are willing to pay when they're not said, you know, told, this is what you're supposed to pay and that's it, but rather get enough information to know what the expenses really are. So we gather all the information and then we look at all the options. And we ask the clients to be absolutely non-judgmental. If the idea sounds ridiculous, we don't care. Just throw it up there. And then we evaluate the options. We look at them and say, okay, if we choose this option, what will result from that? And we're, you know, just very objective about what are the consequences of choosing specific options. And then we look at the options in terms of, does this meet either of your needs? Does it, you know, does it meet both of your needs? And we start eliminating options. Some of them meet nobody's needs. Some of them may meet one needs, but at the detriment of the other. So we try to come at it from a different angle. Once we have narrowed everything down, then we get to a negotiation of the few remaining issues that might be there. And then there's a little bit of bargaining and horse trading like in any negotiation. But because we've done it in this order and we have done it from the, the position of wanting to know what are your values, what do you value, not what the law says you, could, you should value, but what do you and your family value and need the, the entire atmospherics in the room are different. The fact that these attorneys will never go to court enables the attorneys to become part of a settlement team instead of part of a threatening adversarial presence in the room. So it, to me, it is tremendously exciting at the end of a collaborative case to have my client's spouse come over and hug me and thank me for what I've done for their family. For, for a married couple to go out after the divorce hearing, chatting with each other about what they're going to be doing with the children over the weekend. It's those kind of rewards that were so rare when I was a litigator and that quite frankly are so common as a collaborator that I think if I didn't get some kind of a warm fuzzy back, I'd be very disappointed.